Kevin? No. It's Iowa. Hi, Ben. Buenos dias. I'm guessing this isn't the future you have planned for yourself when you first clap dies on this podcast. Don't worry. I'm not the podcast that's after you. I know that. I've heard it. You've heard it? And you're not dead? What's this pod supposed to be? The ultimate badass? Not how I'd describe it. How would you describe the pod? I guess I'd say it doesn't have a sense of humor. This is No Country for Old Men on the Pod of Dreams. Let me ask you something. What's the most you ever lost in a coin toss? Look, I need to know what I stand to win. Everything. Just call it Friendo. What's in the satchel? It's a bowl of money. He's just a guy who happened to find that money. I got a bad feeling, Llewellyn. But it's a mess, ain't it, Sheriff? If it ain't, it'll do till the mess gets here. I'm looking for Llewellyn Moss. Did you go up to his trailer? Yes. Do you want to leave a message? Yes. I don't come back and tell mother I love her. Your mother's dead. Well, then I'll tell her myself. I've got a loose skin in here. You think this boy Moss has got any notion of the sorts that are hunting him? I don't know. He ought to. He's seen the same things I've seen, and it certainly made an impression on me. Just how dangerous is he? Compared to what? The bubonic plague? The crime you see now, it's hard to even take its measure. It's just all out war. You can't stop what's coming. Is this guy supposed to be the ultimate badass? You don't understand. Okay, well, welcome to the Pod of Dreams. We have a very special guest, uh, Danny Haslock, uh, Film Bird Podcast, uh, fellow film lover. Uh, Danny, thanks for joining. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me on. So uh, why don't you just take a second and talk about your, your podcast, uh, you know, if you want to uh, give a shout out to, to anything that you're working on. Yeah, so I am the host of the one of the hosts of the Film Bird Podcast. That's a uh, Film Bird, one word, capital F, capital B. We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, really anywhere that you can find podcasts, we are on. We have weekly episodes where we just kind of talk about movies. And we are just movie enthusiasts, just like you guys here. And, uh, you know, we don't take ourselves too seriously. We just kind of have a good time talking about movies. Lately, we've been talking a lot about uh, newer movies. We're trying to transitioning into some of the stuff that's coming out uh this year but we've talked about movies from the past we've talked about movies from the 70s the 80s we've been all over the place awesome yeah and um i think did you have an episode on army of the dead no i i I did write a blog oh you wrote a blog about it yeah okay we also have the uh the film bird website where we have uh occasional blog posts and um links to our podcast also and so, so i do dabble in uh in writing some stuff when my fingers feel like working but uh, pr- our primary focus is the podcast right now. And how many episodes are you in? Uh, tw- 22, maybe 23, uh, okay. something like that. We started in um, maybe maybe October, maybe September. Um, so we've been doing it for a couple months now. 
And so you said you're, you're all over the place. Do you have any any methodology whatsoever about what movies you do watch or you just decide, hey, what, what do we want to talk about? What are we in the mood to break um, down? Yes and no. Uh, so, like oh. we're, we're, we transitioned a little bit to uh, we're focusing now on what is coming out currently to kind of stay a little trendy. Uh, but sure. uh, overall, if, if we want to talk about something, we're going to talk about it. So we have an episode on Taxi Driver. We have an episode on After Hours. Those are two Scorsese movies, so it's not very diverse. We uh, do a lot of like deep dives on directors. So we have like a Adam McKay episode. We have a um, Green Knight episode. Uh, uh, plenty of stuff out there. We just did the re- our most recent episode was on The Northman, um, which we thought were, was great. Uh, and if you have any interest in that, go check it out. But uh, we kind of do it all. Sadly, I, I have kids, so going out to the movies is a big chore, so I didn't get to see what was on screen, but I did have a chance to see everything everywhere all at once, which was phenomenal. And I, I, it, but I actually uh, have not seen that yet, but that's on our list for, I think, next week or the week after, so I should probably get out and see it before the podcast. And Danny, you were saying before we jumped on, you have bona fides with film, you have education and, uh, you know, you, you have a degree in film. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I studied um, film um, as my, my degrees in. So I've studied film theory. I've studied film history. Um, I am mostly really just um, uh, a lover of film and a cinephile in general. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of my philosophies and what we kind of believe in in my pod is that, you know, film has been the center of American culture for almost a hundred years now. And you don't need a a degree or you don't need to be a huge movie buff to, to enjoy them. Everyone loves talking about movies. So really we try to have that attitude where this is just something that everyone loves and let's uh, do our best uh, to talk about it. You know, I think it was George Clooney. I heard once talking about how like, the fi- like the art form of film is like the only true American art form that like we've created in America and is cultivated. That was like kind of a cool. I didn't think about that. You know, like painting and all of music. Yeah. Like that's developed in other other parts of the world, but like film is a truly American art form. I well, think that's kind of cool. World War One to thank for that. Actually, we were in like <laughs> a big foot race with like France and uh, I don't know if it was UK or the other other country, and then World War One broke out, and they all of a sudden couldn't spend money on film stock. And we were safely thousands of miles away from the conflicts. So we kept turning out movies and we just took absolute stranglehold of the movie market. For yeah, a really I never long time. I never really thought of it like that, but that's a good way to uh, well, I, Yeah, I mean it's just it was I mean it's just economics and it's it's one of those it is super people talk about how devoid of ideas Hollywood is, which is kind of true, but they've always been kind of devoid of ideas and they've always mm-hmm. only ever cared about getting people in the seats and watching movies. Um, you know, they they want they've wanted your money since the beginning. And that's oh, yeah. what's great. That's what's great about it. That's what's awful about it. But that's also why it can be really, really amazing. Um, did you get your degree from the U? Uh, I I think Cloud State University is where I went. Okay, got it. All right. So yeah. So point to my my book. Ben Ben and I are clowns. We uh we just mess around here. You're you're the one that knows what you're talking about. So. Uh, oh no, no, you guys know your stuff pretty well too. <laughs> I've 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 uh, heard a few episodes. You guys do a pretty good job. Well, thank you. So, no country for old men, right? Uh, I reached out to Danny, asked him to join the pod. Pick any movie he could pick, and he picked this movie. Why no country for old men? You know, uh, why why not? Uh, no, uh, there's a lot of reasons why I picked this movie. Uh, in in short, uh, I think it is a perfect movie. Uh, one of my favorites. I have returned to it over and over and over again. Um, it's a very interesting movie in a lot of different ways, and we'll uh, have time to deep dive all of that later. But why I picked this one and not one of my other favorite movies is you guys are an Iowa podcast. Uh, I, I'm here in Minnesota. We're not too far apart, but um, really wanted to you know take a moment to shine on some uh, some Minnesota natives, the Cohen brothers here, and and uh, this is probably. My favorite movie, if not one of their best, and I, I could, you know, pull a, uh, a title out of a hat and, and call it my favorite movie. But, you know, I since um, I'm a Minnesota guy on your Iowa podcast, I thought we'd take the time to talk about the Coen brothers. I, I have that same problem with the Coen brothers. Uh, like if I watch Fargo right afterwards, I'll tell you Fargo is my favorite Coen brothers movie. Mm-hmm. I watch this. Now it's my favorite. If I watch a serious man, that'll be my favorite Coen brothers movie. It's just like it. Mm-hmm. It's just constantly this constant it, whatever I've seen most recently. It's very, very tough. And I. 
I, I yeah, every time I see the the every time I see the Big Lebowski, I go, oh, this is this is my favorite Coen Brothers yeah. movie. <laughs> yeah, and, and I even forgot like watching this, like because their style can be so eclectic and different. Like I even forgot watching No Country that it is a Coen Brothers movie because this one isn't really comedic in the way that like Fargo's got a nice comic energy running through it, and there, there's like none in No Country, and it's not no. a problem. There just isn't <laughs> any. Um, and, and you said I don't I don't want to. I guess I'm just, I mean, I think it's a perfect movie also. I, I mean, it's like, I don't, this is this the only like remotely bad thing to say. This isn't even really Chris. And the only, this is the most negative thing I'll say. The the CGI deer that um, <laughs> he shoots early on in the movie look a little not great. That's the only like bad thing I'll say about this movie. It's like, it's like yeah, okay. it ruined the whole thing. Actually it, terrible. It does not deserve any of the, the best right, picture awards. Right, right. It was like, yeah, okay. The CGI from 15 years ago doesn't look the greatest <laughs> in one shot. It's fine. It's not a problem. Um, but you're right. I mean, it doesn't have any anything else that's a bad shot in it. There's no wasted fluff, and there's never a time where I didn't think it wasn't working superbly. It doesn't drag. It's not even a tiny bit boring. And there's if you want to be a film nerd and go crazy into the meaning and what all is happening and pull a bunch of crazy themes out of it, you absolutely can. There's there's tons of stuff to dive in. Um, Eric, I'm guessing you feel the same way. Am I, am I judging? You know... I might even go a step for this might be the greatest movie ever made. Mm. I mean, oh, honestly, wow. okay. like, let's go. Home. Like, I, I really honestly watch it. The first half, the ha- first half hour of this movie, I think I'd put up against any movie ever. Like, literally, the the up until the coin toss scene, which is like 20 minutes in the movie, which I, 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 I've seen this so many times, but I always am blown away how quickly that scene pops in the movie. But the, I mean, everything that happens leading up to that scene, I'd put that against any movie that's ever been made, honestly. And I think I, if I'm going to criticize anything, the part where Woody Harrelson pops in, I think it drags a bit towards the end of the film to, to just have any sort of criticism. But, yeah, I mean, this might be the greatest movie ever made as far as I'm concerned. You uh, could definitely make that argument. I'm not going to say it, but like, I'm not going to I'm not going to say that it's not like you can't like it because like, like we're we're all in, in agreement. It's 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 damn near a perfect movie. It's just so, it so good. And uh, what I realized on my rewatch this time is that really like ever almost every scene you can just if you, if you're turning it turning it on uh, say it's on TV or whatever would not that it would be um, when you turn it on no matter what how far into the movie it is like you you just get sucked in and you're like oh they're doing oh, yeah. this part now. And it's just you get excited and you're really on the edge of your seat the whole time. And uh, not a lot of movies can do that to me. And this one every time will will suck me in. Well, it's a great like YouTube movie, too, because like I watched it and then uh, leading up to the podcast, I was like, let me watch the coin toss scene on YouTube and watch it. I'm like, amazing. And let me watch the last m- speech that Tommy Lee gives before the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Like you could just queue up any any scene on YouTube and watch it. And you're just like totally sucked in. And it. Like I said, there's there's really not anything else I could criticize about it. It's funny you said you're talking about the Coen Brothers. I just watched Miller's Crossing again over the weekend. Amazing movie. Like it, we haven't even talked about some of their great films. It, again, this might, as far as I'm concerned, might be the greatest movie of all time. Are they the greatest filmmakers ever? Maybe. Like you could make the argument. Mm. Even their yeah. failures are. Not that this is the Coen Brothers podcast, but even their failures are interesting to me. Like Hail Caesar is not a great movie. I don't know why. Watch it again. It's better. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. It's really interesting. It, it There's a lot about it that works and is super compelling. Um, I wouldn't say it's anywhere near the best of all time, but even then that's, that's interesting. It's just, I mean, they, yeah. Barton Fink's great. I mean, they, yeah, they have a lot of great movies. Um, oh, brother. We haven't talked about our brother. Like, yeah, I thought that's very life. different. Holy cow. Yeah. And, and I, the one interesting thing you were talking about, um, you, Ben, you mentioned that this is sort of different for their style. Like they didn't write, that you know, it's it's a Cormac McCarthy Cormac book. McCarthy, right. They didn't write the original story, my, so I have not read the book. My brother read the book and he's he's explained it to me. It is apparently like very very like true. The adaptation is very true. Like even to this to the point where you know when Shiger's strangling the guy and his the the 
their boots scuff the floor. Like that's described in the book exactly how it happens in the movie. So maybe that's a, uh, one of the reasons why it's stylistic. It's a little different is because they didn't write it. It's one of the only that they didn't write. Yeah. And uh, I also have not read the the novel, but everything that I have heard has, has been just praise of how uh, faithfully they've adapted it, which is really cool. Cause you see so many movies that are, are adapted from novels that just completely take a, a left turn and, and just change everything. So it, it is really cool that, how faithfully they adapted it. So uh, there's a and, lot of and, great things. Oh, but yeah, jump and, in. Uh, Sorry. Uh, what's really crazy to me uh, now that I'm talking about it is that that novel I believe came out in like 2005, and then the movie came out in like 2007. So like as soon as uh, the book came out, they're like greenlit, we're going, like it's done, and they're making it, which is like is 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 wild to me. So yeah, there's a lot of great things to talk about, but a couple of things I wanna I wanna bring to the discussion early is the sound design. And the and what you're saying about the details is super interesting, and I and I want to talk about that because I don't think there's a, it may have happened and I may have missed it, but I don't think there's any music in this whatsoever. No, no. Score. There's no score. There's nothing I don't score. Think and, yeah. but, the, but the sounds that everything makes is so detailed and wonderful. Like so, the time he confronts the guy in the gas station, he crinkles up whatever it is the sunflower seeds or nuts that he's eating, and he sets mm-hmm. it down and it zooms in and let's go and it, we hear it uncrinkle when. Anton Chigurh is like in his bathtub, like, you know, nursing his wounds. The way you hear the water. I mean, it's just it's just immaculate how it sounds. The way, the way he opens the motel door and it goes creaks open and mm-hmm. he checks everything. everything out. Yeah. Yeah. Every little sound detail. And even is amazing. Like, even like uh, the, the wind is like a character in this movie. And at, at night you hear the crickets and that those like ambiance, like the, the noise becomes like the score in a way. And you could like you could just hear a hear a pen drop and, and and every every you're right every little thing is just so meticulously placed and you know that like they're perfectly aware of every sound that's there and and everything's there for a reason everything you hear and it's just like it wants it gives you a heart attack like it's so thrilling it's so you're on the edge of your seat you're like oh my god like how and and which is such a credit to them because normally filmmakers like they lean on music and the score to get this emotional effect but they in this movie there's none of that they there's hardly any dialogue in this movie they hardly even talk and everything they say is amazing it's just like perfect lines of dialogue but a lot of the this is like almost a silent film to an extent because like they literally just it's Hitchcocky and how they are showing you different scenes and in 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 leading you in a direction without even saying anything oh yeah well even the very beginning when you have the cop talking to somebody else on the phone and then it just shows you anton chigurh in the background just not making a sound and we just see him he's in focus and we see him come up and hop over his uh handcuffs it's like and you just see him approach it's just it's great and i know everything that's going to happen and it's no less tense this is the third time we've seen it no less tense this time. But you're skipping over, like the the opening monologue from Tommy Lee and how the, sh- the shots of the landscape and him talking about the you know how he was dad was a sheriff in the old other town and how they didn't have carry guns and then 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 it cuts down into Sugar obviously getting arrested and then the old pause about you'd have to put your soul at hazard you'd have to say I'll be part of this world and then there's then the car zooms off and the I mean just the way that the whole staging of that is like terrifying cuz I mean mm-hmm. you know having seen it before you know what's about to happen but like imagine the first time you saw that like it, and I can and it was just like holy shit this is like really some masterful stuff yeah just a bananas way to start a movie so, like, when I saw this, we, I saw it with a bunch of friends. It was, like, the last showing. Um, it was, like, 11 o'clock. We were in the theater by ourselves, smoking cigarettes in the movie theater. <laughs> that was just a crazy experience. And, yeah. I mean, kids from Minnesota did all the time? Yeah. Was... I don't know. Okay. We did it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and one thing that um, I just want to highlight about this movie is just we t- t- talked a little bit already, but Javier Bardem's performance um, in this is I- iconic. And sure, of course, yeah. literally, I think, and you could make an argument to go a lot of different ways, but this might be the best movie villain of all time. And I, I would be in the camp of, of making that argument, I think, most days. 
Yeah, it's yeah. it's him. It's maybe the Joker, Heath Ledger's Joker. But yeah, I, I, I'm I would gonna, I'm gonna pull that back a little bit. I don't know that he's the best villain of all time. He is the Joker without all the theatrics. For sure, they are of a similar ilk. They still come from mm-hmm. the same plot. What's um, a better I'm movie like villain? What's a better movie I, I'm villain? I'm not going to hash out every movie villain ever that, uh, uh, you know, I'll research it and really think about it and reflect on it. No, you have, to get, your, some you have to get your answer seen. right now. He uh, doesn't really it. have a clear ideology. You can try to discern one from his actions, but that's the point, just though. A, you can't make sense of it. Mostly he's just a sociopath and he's just pure evil, which is scary and compelling, but it's not interesting. Um, if he had sure a more coherent is. ethos, it, would, it isn't to me. It's cool, man. It's not to me. Um, I, he it makes him scary and compelling, but d- it doesn't interest. There's nothing to think about. He's just scary. What what is what does he make you think about? What does he make you reflect the on? The evil of man. That th- that's what man is capable. Of. That's the whole point of the time. That's the whole point of the movie. So he just this, shows you how you evil. Understand? He's a, a test case for how evil people can be. That's and that's what's interesting to you. Well, how evil we all are. It's not just. I mean, yes, he's he's the personification of evil. But you know, uh, Tommy Lee tells the story about the the kid who in the opening movie, he'd been planning to kill someone his whole life, and said he's going to hell. Be there in 15 minutes. Like you can't make sense of that kind of thing. That's what the movie's about. What I think is interesting about about the character is that he has like such a a rigid code that he lives his life by that it is so foreign to to us as an audience and like normal people but the way that he like will will make the decision to have you live or die by a flip of a coin and how he is such a believer in in fate and like like he brings it up throughout the whole movie um like your decisions brought you here what good are the rules he says like that and the the thing that he is kind of like just an unstoppable force um it's almost like he is like um like straight out of halloween or like a slasher movie because he just does not go down and uh, it really is a a credit to uh, the the coen brothers i think because i've talked about this um a lot of uh, on my pod, but there's there's a lot of criteria I think to how to how to judge if a movie is good or not, or 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 what is a good movie. But something that I specifically look for is the how the how a director or a filmmaker blends genre. And this movie is almost impossible to to label. I feel like for a genre, like yes, you can call it a thriller, um, you can call it a western, you can call it a noir. You can call it a a horror movie. Um, it, it is it's a, a a cat and mouse movie. Like there's so many different ways that it, it it can go, and it blends it together really well, like almost flawlessly. Which I is always like a huge credit to me. Yeah, the the one thing you mentioned the coin. Like I I really do love the aspect of that. You know, not only the the, the flipping the coin to decide people's fate, but how. You know, Shiger and Llewellyn Moss are kind of the opposite sides of the coin. And there's a bunch of symmetry in the movie, too. Like, when the movie starts, Shiger, uh, before he kills the, the guy where he steals his car, he's like, hold still. And he, then he puts <laughs> the thing up and kills him. And then it cuts to um, Llewellyn sh- hunting the deer. And he's got the deer sighted. And he's like, come on, hold still. And it's yeah. just the, the symmetry of those two. Um, and they both you know, buy clothes from other people for and a lot they of money. Both get injured and have to sort of fix themselves. It's a great chess match for sure. Yeah, it, I, yeah. I, I do love that. You know, with the the metaphor of the coin and and the symmetry between those two characters, it, it's, it's just amazing. It really is. So then, if we're thinking about that, does though Llewellyn have a tragic flaw that he's attracted to women? Is that I mean, he does really good. He really holds his own against somebody we're saying it's kind of the personification of pure evil at least i'm saying that and then in the end he's has some beers with the lady outside a hotel and he drops his guard down or is that just dumb luck no just like getting hit by the car the way I, the way i see it is that again it's 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 the world changing and men like that don't fit in it and you know there's no way to to a good can't win in that battle you know there's no, there's no winning for good. There's, it's, it's sort of a nihilistic way to look at the world, but I think that's what they're trying to say, is this isn't a country for good people, good men. Like, yeah, I think a, a big message of the movie is that this is not your typical like hero's journey, and that, it, it, where Hollywood has taught us that 
you know, the good guy should win and that uh, no matter what, he'll overcome the odds, even no matter how um, colossal his enemy is. And the Coen brothers are kind of just saying, fuck that. Like, this guy is better. Like, he, he is better at what he does. He's a psychopath. There's no stopping him. And we think as an audience that um, he can combat it a little bit because we see how smart he is and how like intuitive he is about things and he, um and you know they both were, were nom and everything and they have the background but at the end of the day like you just can't beat this guy and i think they're really just trying to it's almost a very like you're saying a very narcissistic view on um kind of life and uh, that it's kind of shitty and things don't always work out it's pretty uh it's pretty dark Oh, interesting. I was going a different direction because it Willen has the problem. This is always the hero's problem is he has attachments and people that he cares about and that he's trying to save. Uh, and Shigur doesn't. He doesn't have anybody. He doesn't care about anybody. It's just himself. And that frees him um, from a lot of ways. Right. Uh, but Shigur didn't, Shigur didn't kill him, though. That's the other piece of it, too. It was the the i guess the mexicans yeah. that found right out. because but he, he had to meet up with his his wife and his mother-in-law and that and then she spilled the beans to the mexicans and that's how he got shot he was also flirting with that lady so maybe he wasn't as right as he could have been so he i don't know yeah because I mean, you, do, you do hear her scream right like she's so there yeah she is she in the room with him is that what you're trying i don't know if that's totally clear in the movie we don't know we don't know exactly but i, well, I didn't know if they were well, fooling around um i think that they they weren't because i think in, if i if my knowledge of the book that i didn't read is correct <laughs> sure uh that they have like a pretty uh their, their relationship doesn't doesn't go that way they, they have a bigger relationship in the book i'm pretty sure like they, they go out to lunch and they have like a um they, they have a little more dialogue in the book but it, it re- remains uh platonic i think but we see the 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 shot transitions goes to dark and then comes back and she was at the pool and she's dead and laying in the pool so i think what we're, we're brought to to that conclusion that they um probably never even went into the room together but either way uh, it, it could be re- it's a little ambiguous so it could be ready either way sure no no, there, no there's no clear answer to some of the stuff it's intentionally vague which is great I mean, I'm just just thinking out loud i guess about some of the stuff that's happened in the movie. It, i guess i've always kind of been curious does does Shigur get the money in the end, or do the Mexicans get it? I the, think I, I also was very curious about this, and I was really paying attention to that this time. I think Shigur gets it because I think the Mexicans were looking for it and they couldn't find it. And then we see when Tommy Lee Jones is in the room after the fact, um, we see that the the vent is taken off with sure. the, with, the, with the coin next to it, which is how he did it previously. So he probably went in and got it. Um, Because that was my biggest question going into it before my rewatch of it today was who ended up with the money. Um, But I think I think he got it. And I think we got to believe he's I mean, he's pure again. I mean, he's got no attachment to anything. We see he he has no problem murdering the white drug dealers and anybody else that gets in his way. So even if the Mexicans got it, I would say he he gets it somehow. I mean, at that point, I believe in his own ability to get it done that they wouldn't hold it for long so i I got so ben are you trying to say that the movie is is indicating like loving women is a flaw is that because there isn't a whole lot of women i mean llewellyn's wife is the only real female character in the movie so there doesn't there's not a lot of this this movie fails the bechdale test for sure right like no doubt about it. oh yeah Undoubtedly, not a lot of female perspective. Is that is that what you're saying? I guess Ben, I was curious about that. I think it's interesting. No, I'm just thinking out loud. I mean, so the, Josh Brolin does really well, really, really well for a really long time. Better than we see anybody else. Woody Harrelson is terrible. I'm not, I don't mean a terrible actor. I mean in terms of the chess match, he gets owned instantly mm-hmm. and does nothing and contributes nothing to, to the battle, and he just makes a fool of himself and dies. Josh Brolin really, really. I mean, we get to see a real like. He, down to the detail. He's thinking about the same details that Anton Schurt. What's my room going to be? I'm looking at the layout. Where should I stay? Where's the safest place for me to stay? And where's it in relation to the vents? Um, and I'm going to another room, so I'm going to make myself a smaller target. And all these decisions really m- add up to a lot. And he's able to barely survive, but Anton Schurt gets injured in the in the and there, it's a stalemate. Um, and then the first time he mis- makes him say is he tries to meet his wife. He's not. 
he's not going mano y mano. He's trying to meet his wife somewhere, and that creates an opening. She has the information. Now there's a weakness that people are able to exploit. And I don't think women necessarily, though possibly, but people in general is sort of more of what I was thinking. Human attachment is a weakness that is potentially exploited. And again, I'm just really thinking. Maybe it's nothing. Um, but that was where my brain was at. Like, what is it just bad luck that kills Josh Brolin, or is it did he make a mistake, or is there something to be read there? That was, I guess, where my brain was going. I'm not saying women specifically, but you could go that direction. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Just uh, uh, makes him more vulnerable. Sure. Because, um, I mean, at that point, you, you, I mean, he doesn't make a mistake up until that point. And maybe you say that isn't a mistake either um, when he goes to the hotel and wherever that is, El Paso. Um, but, but that's the, the ends of dead at that point. Um, or his luck runs out, maybe. I don't know. I just I thought do, it was interesting. I do think that is like one of my, you're talking a little earlier um, about uh, how he is so like, um, thinking of all these things, all these details um, that make it so that make him like survive better than um, Woody Harrelson's character does. And I think really think that's like the best part of the movie is just like is. See, see, seeing seeing him just craft these different ways that we would as an audience, we would never expect think of it and uh, see him like outsmart this like unstoppable force is like so so fun it's like such a like a little thrill ride to go on yeah like when he's buying the supplies like i need a i need the uh tent poles like well tell me what tent you need i can order either ah just give me a tent which one the one with the most poles like, yeah hilarious that whole scene is just incredible and every choice is really smart and thoughtful and he's figuring i mean it's just really really clever the approach to take to all of it see i mm-hmm. think actually i think there are a lot of cohen-esque jokes in the movie i i you know, you mentioned, I think, Ben, you said you didn't think it was very funny, but there's a lot of those little quips that... Just not in comparison to Fargo. Fargo... Yeah, it's is, not Lebowski, yes, it's not... Well, like I didn't a, say Lebowski, I said Fargo. Um, but even a movie like Fargo, which deals with I would say it's very crime. similar to Fargo in oh, the Oh, I comedy. disagree. I disagree, but... How's anyway. the boots working out? Oh, they're doing great, I just need everything else. You, you don't get a lot of guys coming here without any clothes on, do you? Like, there's no, just that's a lot, unusual. Yeah, there's just there's a lot of those jokes in there that Cohen's are so great at yeah they always find a way to get something in there but yeah as far on the scale of, of comedy it's definitely uh uh tilting a little more in the serious direction which is totally totally okay but yeah there if you're if you're looking for it they got a, they got a couple for you yeah i just i don't think i laughed once during this which isn't i don't view that as a problem i was and too yeah. busy trying not to have a heart attack the right. whole time <laughs> right it's it's just intense um from the get-go um so we talked about Josh Brolin, how he dies off camera. That was I hated. I hate that they killed him off camera because Josh Brolin's like probably my one of my favorite actors. Like absolutely love the guy as an actor. It was so bummed that he just gets killed off camera, and he doesn't get killed by sugar. But I think, I think they're trying to say something with that. You know that well, sure that you know that again. That's not not just there's not just the one evil. There's all all of evil, all of its evil, and you can't stop what's coming to you. That's I think that's kind of the general theme of the movie. Yeah, yeah. Josh Brolin is fantastic in this movie too, and this is like kind of starts a little bit of a renaissance for him too, because yeah. he hasn't really been been around a, a, a bunch up until this, and this kind of restarts his career a little bit. Not that he was like he's always been Josh Brolin, you know what I mean? And and but now he like he's had this new uh, uh, Amazon series that he's doing right now. I haven't watched any of it, but I heard it was really good, which just seems like a lot like he's the same guy, which I'm all for. Um, yeah, he's in Dune. He's Thanos. Yeah. Like the guy's everywhere. Like he's yeah. in everything. He's in the now. second Deadpool movie. I I remember watching this and then realizing at some point, oh, that's the older brother from Goonies. I was like, oh wait, mm-hmm. that's the same guy. Oh, I mean, I had that in 2007. Oh, that's the same dude. Holy I don't smokes. know. I don't know of a lot of actors that could do this. Like the tough sort of Texan kind of gruff guy, but you also are rooting for him. I mean. Christian Bale maybe could do it. I, I just there's not a ton of do you know, McConaughey. Do you know who almost got the role? No. That he turned it down because he just had a a daughter that was born and he wanted to spend time with her. Um, we already talked about it on this pod. It was Heath Ledger. Was, oh was, man, was, was gonna get this role and he turned it down. Wow, yeah, I didn't what, know that. What a different movie that would have been. I mean, he could do it. I mean, we've seen him uh, do a lot of stuff, uh, and this this is like the year before. The Dark Knight came out, right. uh, which would have been an insane uh, little two-year stretch for him. Um, 
But I'm glad that it went to to Brolin because I think like he he was absolutely perfect for it. Yeah, but Heath Ledger's interesting. He's like broke back. He's kind of yeah. rough. We've He's seen him do the range. yeah do the cowboy thing a little bit. Yeah, and maybe oh. that's also why he was having a daughter and also yeah, I already did the cowboy thing. Yeah, um, no, everybody's perfect. I mean, if there were if there were if I had to cut part of this movie out, and I, I don't want to have to cut a second of it out, but if I did, it would be Woody Woody Harrelson's part, and he's great in it. But it's it's like what three scenes yeah um, like not a lot at all almost no screen time but uh every time uh i i, I see woody harrelson i'm just a big woody harrelson fan in, oh, in no, he's great. I, I like him a lot he's just the he's the least in, indispensable of all the people and we haven't oh. even talked about tommy lee jones who's just masterful i mean his lines are all just dialogue all the time and he he it's just great. Every word yeah, he that, says is great. You want to go out there? It was any new bodies appear out there? Nah, I think I could skip it. <laughs> yeah. And and is there a reason why he's so yeah. distrustful of the DEA? Is there any? Is there something? So, I'm, local sheriff. Of course he would be. You that, want some help dealing with a guy who's like a world class sociopath, and you you seem to understand him better than any character in the movie, really. Because he care, he only cares about Llewellyn Moss. Like he doesn't care about the drugs or the money. Like, sure. He just wants to the citizens of his town protected, and I think that's that's his mission. He doesn't care. I mean, the rest of it's let the DEA or the FBI let them figure that right, out. But couldn't they help in that at front? But whatever. I mean, that's that's fine. I I also think that he just like doesn't have a lot of faith in like that that kind of um like police work or, or that organization. I guess because uh, like he said, there throughout the movie, there's like, a few different times where he just kind of shits on them. And we're like, like he, he seems like he, he, it's almost like he's like looking down on him. He's like, why would I need their help? Like I, I can do this better. He's like, they're, they're just going to like, like they go back to the crime scene like three times. I'm pretty sure. And he's like, what are they? They're, are, they're not going to find anything else. Like why That's are they going back? He, he makes more headway than anybody else does by just like sipping coffee and thinking about but it. But even that, <laughs> even a scene where they're first surveying the crime scene and they're checking out the slugs, which caliber they are like, they're, they're talking about how there was like a, this guy's an execution style killing and here's probably where the dispute was like it's it's incredible it's the breaking down a crime scene like that just, you just can't beat it I, like really it's it's so mad and you Tommy Lee Jones you're right like he carries this movie the humanity of it and we could talk about that I'd love to talk about the ending but I mean we'll, we'll certainly get there at some point but uh, he's incredible. Yes, I, lo- I love when he uh, they go to Josh Brolin's um, uh, trailer for the first time to check it out, and they they you see that the lock on the door is like it makes like the imprint on on the wall, and he comes in and um he sits down and he goes ah, it's still sweating and he the milk yeah. and yeah. he goes and pours himself a glass of the milk. And just, they're like, what, they're like who is this guy? What is he well, doing? You know that dialogue. What? Should we put an APB for somebody who's just recently yeah, drank milk recently drank and drinks the milk? <laughs> but that's that symmetry again, though, because when Shigur sits down and drinks the milk, you see him in the reflection of the TV. Yeah. And you see the same shot with Tommy Lee when he sits down drinking the milk. It's just his reflection of the TV. Yeah, they are constantly going back and forth between, like, uh, good and bad and the perspectives and, like, mirroring it, you know, like you were saying before. Uh, yeah, that's really cool part of the movie also um but yeah so so the ending like what are your guys thoughts on the final scene like the so so there's the scene where tom really talks to the old retired cop which i think is phenomenal you know the the you can't you can't stop what's coming at you that's vanity and where he tells him he's retiring but like i mean like the end of the movie the last scene this the this, the dream that he has with his wife like what what are your guys thoughts on that like what that means to the movie um I think you could interpret it a lot of ways. I, I how I view it, um, is kind of him coming to grips with death, uh, where he uh, is kind of exhausted his his whole life, and he's had this whole battle of of I wanted to make a difference in this community, and I wanted to you know be the guy that you know stops crime, and has as he gets older, he's realizing that he has not made a difference at all. Crime is probably worse now than it ever has been. And so what reflecting on his legacy as a lawman, what, what, what has he contributed? And I think that he's kind of coming to grips that he didn't contribute anything. And I, we, as people, you could look back and you could say, well, I'm sure he saved the lives of many people throughout his years and did a lot of good things. But to him, he's like, I wanted to, 
stop crime and he he couldn't and i think he's coming to grips with his age and that he's ready to die which is kind of sad and fucked up but i think that's what it is wow i i had a different read on the weird dream he has like i guess i mean i mean the i kept thinking about the title no country for old men i um it's a fascinating title because i'm trying to think of how it ties to the theme and he that first intro that you talked about eric where you know Talks about people didn't used to have to carry guns as though the country's gotten worse and more violent. But we get later on, that's kind of bullshit. That he's got people that were older than him that got brutally murdered in like the early 1900s by some native people. Um, it, and and it, the it, one it, guy was shot. The one, the, you know, the one cop. That's why he's his in a wheelchair. Uncle or dad, yeah. or yeah, I don't remember which he, one they, it was. They worked together. They, it was his deputy. Right. It was his yes. dad's deputy or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, but. It, it's it's a nonsense notion that somehow things have gotten more violent and you can of course trace America's roots violence is in the very very core of it all um and it's just like seeped into the very very soil same thing in the title but I guess I view the ending as a little more optimistic and I think you're totally right Danny that he's feeling like he failed he failed both to save Llewellyn um you can't stop pure evil because I mean he's just unstoppable um they refer to him as a ghost. It's almost supernatural. It's it's inevitable. Um, but then he has this dream about his dad not talking to him and walking past him in the dark. And he said his dad was going ahead to light a little fire. I viewed that with optimism. Like, yes, it's a dark, cold, brutal world. But his dad just created a little bit of warmth. Just a little fire. It's not going to stop the dark. It's not going to cure the darkness. The darkness is going to be there. But it's just like a little bit of light, a little bit of warmth amidst this cold, brutal reality. And I I viewed it as optimistics, maybe overstating it, but as sort of kind of accepting that that's what he did in a sense. I, I don't think he, I don't know if he has kids, but um, created a little bit of a fire in a dark, cold world. It didn't stop the darkness, but it's just this little bit that he did. That's how I read it. Anyway, Eric, I don't know what your, your take that is. That is much more optimistic than what I was thinking. But sure. It's fair game. Whatever. It, it, there's no right or wrong answers. Um, but that's that was my read. That was when I was thinking about it. But Eric, that's, that's interesting. So I, I watched that final scene a few times because I was like, I, I the, the first time I saw it, I was totally confused. I didn't understand how that related. Yeah, yeah and but, it seems really important. So he talks about two dreams. So the first dream, he's like, I was a little kid. My dad gave me some money and I lost it. And I think, I think he's relating that to the plot of the movie, right? The movie's about Roland's character finds some money, he's getting chased, and and, he, and it it turns evil because he stole it, and death is a result of that. So I I think that's part of what he's trying to say is like, you know, money can lead people to greed, and, and you know, f- chasing after it can lead to to harm, and and uh, which is what happened in the plot of the movie. And then the second dream, like you said, he's talking about the fire. And, it, and I love the way Tommy Lee gets so emotional when he's talking about because he's like, he's like, I'm actually older now, 20 years than my dad ever was. So I, it, in the dream, I'm actually the older man, which is kind of crazy. Like, oh, shit, that's kind of a wild thing to think about. Hmm. Um, but then, yeah, then, then he talks about the fire. He's like, but he, the last thing he says is like, I knew that he'd be, he'd be there when I got there. You know, it's like he knew that his dad would be there when he needed him. Or at the end, I I, th- I really think I think like Danny's saying he's just reflecting on death. Like when I die, I'm, I'll see my dad again. And I think that's that's kind of the idea. And so I, yeah, it's an interesting way to think about it. But and then it just cuts to black. End of the movie. And he's like, and then I woke up. Boom. End of the movie. So <laughs> amazing. So great. And, and it's one of the smallest roles, but his wife is perfectly cast too. She's great. I mean, she has like, like two scenes, but I also think perfectly yeah, cast. When are you gonna start uh, paying me for the horses? <laughs> right. She's like, oh, I think I'll help out around here. She's like, Yeah, you better not. Yeah. One of the like, biggest credits to this movie, I think, is the the casting of minor roles because oh, like yeah. everyone everyone that's like just in it for like a scene or two is amazing. Like the guy, the old guy um at the beginning with the, the coin flip scene, he is perfect. Yeah. I couldn't think of anyone else that that is would he do. Even close to his good job, and when he uh, is like um, talking to him about, like, oh, so you you married into it? Yeah. And he's like, well, if you wanna if you wanna look at it like that, well, there's no other way to look yeah. at it. Like, this is just how it is. Yeah. He's like, well, we're closing now. You gotta like, see about do- closing up. Yeah. <laughs> what, what time, time do you love- close <laughs> it? <laughs> I love you can see just the look. Now is not a time. Sugar just get pissed <laughs> off. Like you just see, you, you mm-hmm. ask him a question, he's gone. Hair trigger. Um. Mm. 
And then you just see him fuck with the guy for, I don't know, three minutes and then almost kill him. It's just ludicrous. I mean, even like Steven Root, you have him in this movie for one scene for no reason. And he's amazing. Every time that guy shows up, I'm on board for Steven Root. And one of the things you're kind of touching on here, I mean, so Shigeru seems just like pure evil to me. Like his motivation to get the money isn't about the money. It's about some pride or other weird thing. I mean, what's he going to spend the money on? What does he need money? He doesn't, I feel like he doesn't care at all. It's just, he doesn't want anybody else to well, have it. And who it. hired him? Because he shoots the other, he shoots he the He was hired like, by manage. the white guys, I thought. And the then white he just kills dealers. him? Yeah, I, th- I assume yeah. so. That was He's my like, assumption. He, he was like, you disrespected me by uh hiring other people to get it he's like when you when you do a job you pick the right tool and you stick with it and he just kills them <laughs> yeah he, t- he took offense to it and then decided he was going to punish them and take the money as yeah a violation of their contract in his own weird head or whatever i mean it's not it doesn't seem to be about the money uh, but there is a very clear like capitalistic thread to this like other than the tommy lee jones thing i think one of the very last things we get are those two kids on a bike like bickering about money, right? They mm-hmm. see the accident and I just love the kid just saying, I think he says it three times. Look at that fucking bone. <laughs> yeah. Look at that bone. I mean, he's like yeah. totally what a, a kid like, Jesus, I'm seeing a bone sticking out of an arm. Be pretty crazy. And he pays the guy like 500 bucks for the kid's shirt. And like, you guys didn't see anything. And then one of the kids like, you know, part of that money's mine. He's like, you still have your shirt. And then we just see them quarrel and the camera moves away. And there's just a lot of this, yes, the pursuit of money itself is a sort of evil or a misdeed or leads to people being awful. Um, and obviously, yeah, it doesn't work out for Llewellyn either, but I, yeah, it's very, very interesting to me. I kept thinking about like those two kids um, fighting over the 500 bucks. Just a lot of money in the early year, what, 1980? Yeah, I think a movie takes place in 1980, right? They do mm-hmm. make that clear exactly what year but it the is. The old guy in the con- convenience store is like... This coin was 1958, and it found itself for 22 years to get to you. Um, yeah, so it's 1958. Yeah, which is the only the only way to distinguish what year it is, because really you could not tell at all because like we're in just rural Texas. It, it, this could be 1950 or 2010. You wouldn't know because it's just the, in the middle of nowhere. There's a Jack Link's beef jerky in that scene behind them at the convenience store. I'm like, did that exist in 1980? Maybe I had that, that same idea. stupid thought. I'm like, okay. is that anachronistic? Should that not be in there? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. If, yeah, I don't know if Jack Link's was right. It doesn't matter. I But that was a dumb thought that in my head. Well, so Eric and I watched Near Dark pretty recently, which also has a lot of rural. And, but the rural Texas is another character in this movie. You kind of alluded to the wind and everything else. It's fantastic. All the settings, all the city streets. Everything just looks amazing, mm-hmm. um, feels amazing. It feels palpable and real well, and visceral. The, the other Pretty. thing we haven't really talked about so is like the action in this movie. I think is really really top tier. Like of course, the, yeah. The, the sequence where Brolin goes back to to give the guy water, agua. Don't have any agua, and he brings it back to him. And then the the Mexican guys. Uh, come up on the car and they're shooting at him. The dog chases him and he, he's got to take the one bu- uh, slug out of the gun to, to get to dry it off and put the other bullet in and he whoo, blows the yeah, gun and like, shoots. <laughs> Incredible electric. stuff. Yeah, it's so suspenseful and so exciting. And then just the shootout at the one motel with Shigur where he jumps out the window and he com- comes around to the back. Like, really incredible gunfight action stuff. That Well, it's the sound design plays into that because the bullets sound so loud and impactful and real. It's not cartoony like a lot of times in action movies. Like, mm-hmm. you feel like the visceral, that, that piece of metal is flying by real fast. You hear the explosion pushes that metal. You hear the clattering and smashing of glass. And that's all you hear. And it's like otherwise contrasted with silence, and it's just it's so evocative and great. Yeah, just uh, having no score, no music, just makes it so much more intense than that because it's like every little thing you just pick up, and also just the like countless number of scenes where there's like someone on the other side of a door, and you're like, <laughs> what's going to happen when they open this oh, door? That, that showdown, even when like they're both turning off the lights. Mm-hmm. and looking at each other and it's it's he measures how wide the door in his room is so he knows like if i shoot through this is it gonna hit the guy but yeah i mean when you think of like modern movies now like for example we, we kind of rag on marvel i love marvel movies but like those fight scenes action scenes they don't seem real like they don't oh, feel no. like they're actually fighting what? Or 
any stakes to it. Compa- and then you watch this movie, and it's like no, these it's CGI guys, blobs flying at each you other. You don't, you don't think that uh, Doctor Strange looked look, didn't look real to you? Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. I enjoyed <laughs> it, but it, it didn't feel real in in the way that this. No, was. no, it's absolutely just yeah. entirely fake. No, I'm, I'm, yeah. just, I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> Yeah, no, it really is really just like centered in like ultra realism where where that's where it's scary, too, because you're like, this is like this could happen at, at I mean, pretty much not to anyone. But this this could happen for sure. You could like look out your 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 your, your window and see something going on like this. And it, it's, it's like a real set up real. It's awesome. Yeah, this is what it looks like when a bullet hits somebody in the neck or whatever. That poor guy driving down the street who gets stopped <laughs> by Josh oh. Brolin. I ain't going to hurt you. Like, yeah, okay. All of, like, the, the, the DIY, uh, um, uh, like, first aid in this is just amazing. I, I do love how lax border security was in 1980. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. it, that's – I'm sure it was that way. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not calling it false. I'm just – how ludicrous that is to my brain to think, oh, you can literally just walk up, hold a beer, and it goes, eh. Well, that's the difference between going into Mexico and coming into the U.S., you know? Well, even now, yeah. it's just one guy that he has to convince. Like, I, I doubt it's that easy. I'm sure you have to prevent paperwork. Yeah. And I guess he had the Vietnam connection, which helped, too. I guess to, that was part uh, of it. To go off of your point about the whole uh, um, capitalist uh, thing also is when he's cr- going to the border and he uh, they're, they're buying the jacket off of the guy, 500, 500 hundred bucks for the jacket and he goes give me the beer too He's like how much for the beer like, just give him the beer right yeah again like comparing the same scene with sugar who buys the shirt off the kid you're right it's so what do we think yeah. sugar's re- so luan's wife refuses to call the coin is that a capital offense to anton sugar yeah yeah i think so okay i, I think he's he needs that you know he he needs her to to flip the coin to, well, but she says she's not going to call it. My point is, he, he flips the coin. And yeah, says, well, he needs, yeah, he needs her to call it. But she says, I'm not going to do it. So is he like, well, then I'm just going to shoot you, and that's that's a decision? Does his brain say that's a decision, or is it like pathological? Like, oh, I guess I can't shoot her until she calls it. Because we don't see him shoot her. We don't know. It's one of the mm-hmm. one of the mysteries where we don't know for yeah, sure. Yeah, he wipes his boots. You, it's. I think you can assume he shot her. When he walks out of the uh, walks out of the room, he, he looks at his boots and he wipes it. Like there was must have been blood on his boots. Okay. Unless, uh, you know, because her mom's dead, so she was the only one in, in the house. So, yeah, I think you can assume he shot her. She yeah, had to I, die. I would, uh, uh, I would make the assumption that, that she's dead, but they, they do uh, make it a little ambiguous. But it's really interesting because, yeah, she, she, his, his whole philosophy about uh, you making the choice and, and she's just undercutting the whole thing where she's like, no, like the coin doesn't decide you decide, like either kill me or not. Like I'm not playing your game, um, which is like a cool way to stand up to an, an, an oh, inevitable it death. It's a, yeah, right. Well, it's, it's, it's obviously Har- because Harrelson's be- begging for his life and he tells him, he's like, it, you'd have, there'd be more dignity in it if you just accepted it. And she does like, and, and also a cool thing that in his choice to, to kill people, so when he only picks up the he does the the coin flip when it people stumble onto him basically accidentally pretty much or that people it's when people come into his path that it's not their fault if it's not your fault that that we cross paths you get to do it the the courtesy of a coin flip um but the people that seek him out like woody harrelson they don't get the benefit of a coin flip they just get to die but because like uh, the person at the convenience store, um, it's not his fault that he showed up. He's like, OK, well, even though he obviously didn't like him very much and he uh, disagreed with how he lives his life, he gave him the benefit of a coin flip. Uh, um, his wife. Yes, like he's, he, he has to do this because he promised promised his um, husband that he'd murder his wife. But he's like, that's not your fault. You get a coin flip. Um, so there is like a little bit of a um, a method to his madness but it's just uh i don't know if that makes him better or worse it makes him psychotic i think it's an obnoxious pretense for him to try to absolve personal responsibility from what's happening um an agency but he's like a yeah i don't know but that's me that's my i'm bringing that to the movie i'm not necessarily saying that's what you mm-hmm. somebody should take away i think you know i agree well, with he's you obviously know, just but, like 
the biggest psychopath ever. And actually, um, when I was doing a little bit of uh, research on this movie, there there was a study. And, and don't quote me on any of this because this Uh-oh. is like no, I, I am I'm not taking like this to citing, heart, Danny. I am not citing sort of sources right now. But apparently there was a study about uh, uh, psychopaths de- depicted in in movies, and apparently this is the the most realistic portrayal of a psychopath um in movies from some study from like some nyu university or something like that which i thought was kind of crazy sure yeah I mean, and I, javier bird he won best supporting actor for this right so he, this movie like yeah. swept the oscars like create uh, best picture mm-hmm. best yeah, supporting actor, best screenplay and, and tommy lee jones i think was nominated for best actor which was weird to me because he was in like half the time as harvey bird but it, the the Whatever. supporting and best actor rules are so wonky and arbitrary that's kind of silly. Usually they put the person in whatever the thing gives them the best chance to win. Um, I, I don't remember who gets to decide, but I think either it's the actors themselves or the studio. I don't remember which it is, but they get to just decide. So you have yeah. that weird, like, okay. Yeah, Javier's like Roland's kind of the, the star lead. of the movie. Roland's the lead of the movie, right? Sure, yeah, and you but, could say Javier is the co-lead. I mean, he, those two have the most screen time, right? By far. Yeah, just screen time. It's like pretty like fifty fifty, I'd say. But yeah, yeah. they're close. It, it's those two. Timely Jones is like a is in the third spot, but right, right. They still carry the like. It's those three carrying the movie though. They could go really either way. Sure. Um, um, and then just yeah, loads of just, fantastic sporting roles. Go ahead, sorry. Just for uh, my curiosity, what is your guys' favorite scene? There's so many you could pick from. But I was just wondering. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the the coin toss is the f- most famous. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, I, literally, I could watch that when, like, whenever. Um, I, I I really like I like when Tommy Lee Jones and the deputy first go to the the crime scene, but I also like when Brolin first uh, goes to the crime scene, and then and then when he gets attacked when he comes back. So that, those will probably be my two favorites. Boy, if I had to pick one scene, I mean, this is the thing, like, because. And this this sounds like I'm being hyperbolic. I'm really not. Other than the deer scene, and I guess maybe I'd probably put the uh, Woody Harrelson scenes just like the one B to the one A. The rest are almost equally wonderful and perfect um, to me. But if I had to pick one, I mean, it's just the showdown at the hotel. Everything that happens, every second is is filled with meaning. When you know Josh Brolin reaches for the phone to see if the clerk's still alive, sets it back down reaches for it we see the shadow coming underneath everything leading up to the pop of the lock yeah and then the shotgun shot is to me super duper immaculate i mean it's just the one thing I, I hated about that is is that he didn't throw the the tracer thing out the window like immediately when he discovered that there was the the tracker in the suitcase i wish he had just like chucked it out the window because Knowing that Sugar is gonna be there pretty soon, you know what I mean. Like I thought that would have bought him some time, but that you know you're right. It's an incredible scene. I mean, it happens right right after is Sugar is there when he discovers it basically. Mm-hmm. I, outside the door, pretty much. Yeah, he, yeah. Like, I can't think about. It. He's like you see his brain processing. Like there's no there's no fucking way. Or well, he, he, says. he sets it down and then turns it off. It's like I wish he just like I would have immediately. Like, oh shit, he's good because he would have followed the sound. If well, the, but, all of a sudden the sound disappears, he's gonna maybe go away. Maybe, but I think he's piecing it all together. His brain's constantly working, right? He wakes up in the middle of the night. He's like, how did he find my exact hotel so quickly? There was like no lead time. How did he do it? Am I safe? There I ain't no sleep. way. Yeah, there ain't no and then way. He, then yeah. he goes through and he's like, his brain piece. Oh, man. I, oh, shit. And by that time, he senses everything's wrong. It's quiet. There's somebody outside. It's probably too late to get rid of the tracker. And then I'm, I'm in the showdown. But even then, everything after that is just immaculate. It just doesn't get any better. As far as action, tension, character development, it's just great. It's just, yeah, I guess yeah. two ubermensch, old school dudes, very, very smart, um, just confronting each other. And then everything that follows is also equally great, too. But I just love that moment. It was just the absolute apex of a movie that's almost all apex. What about you, Danny? Um, yeah, I, it'd be hard for me to not pick the the coin flip scene. I, I could probably watch that on just on a, on repeat for 10 hours every day if I wanted to. Uh, but other than that, I, I'd go with the the shootout outside of the hotel after after that scene where they are kind of going back and forth in the street. Uh, that's just like hands down, just electric. 
and it's crazy and he's just trying to steer the freaking truck and he also, manages to make it around the corner just oh, fantastic i'll go in the honorable mentions here and uh, i i hesitant to even put it in here because it's kind of disgusting but when uh we see uh sugar put uh do when he um uh blows up the car to get the uh, shit from the pharmacy and then goes back into the room and he's like just uh, operating on himself. It's just oh, that's awesome. great. It's so love- hard to watch, but I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. I love he puts on the plastic and then he kicks off his boot and there's like blood dripping oh. from his leg. Yeah. Mm. And you, he, the way he's like, you could tell he's in so much pain and the, the just incredible acting. He won his Oscar right there. I mean, he, he, he didn't need that scene, but I mean, you, yeah. you're right though. It is great. Everything you'd be hearing the swash of the water. He puts the, the light iodine, the yeah, in the iodine mm. thing and shakes it up. Yeah. I want to make like a like a five minute compilation of just all of the times Javier Bardem is just getting just excruciatingly injured in this movie and just mash it up together just one after another. This guy is just getting the shit kicked out of him all movie. He just does not stop. It's incredible. The, the broken bone at the end. Oh, yeah, let me yeah, let so, me just sit. Let me just sit. Let me just sit. And then he like slings his arm. Up. Yeah, that was uh, the, actually I think about that was I think the one time I laughed. Was like I'm just gonna sit here a minute where yeah, he looked genuinely dazed. <laughs> like that's the one time where he looked. It was I mean it's for ten seconds, but it was like where he didn't know what to do. That was like the only time he didn't know what to do. Other thing yeah. I noticed, he didn't he didn't run the red light right. It was just some no, it's other random bad ass- luck. Some random. It's just asshole. completely bad yeah. luck. It's dumb yeah. luck. He was correct. Somebody else blew the red light and he got seriously yeah. jacked up. Say what you want about Antoine Chagrin, but he is uh he follows the rules of the road. Yeah. Signaled when he turned, I think, <laughs> up there. He, yeah, he follows the laws. <laughs> yeah, Law, most, most laws. <laughs> most laws. Not, not all the laws of man. The laws of the road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just thinking now all about I mean, this is where you could get try to write write a, a long piece about it. You were talking Eric about do you know reflection or two sides of the coin? Remember his Huon's wife says, "I got a really bad feeling about it." And he's like, "Well, I got a really good one. I guess they cancel each other out." That was kind of what happened with him and, and Javier Bardem um, up until he gets killed by the Mexicans. Like they seemed to almost cancel each other. It was like almost a draw. It's kind of how I felt. Like the conflict turned out. Nobody won. Nobody lost. Just a, mm-hmm. just a pure bloodletting draw. Um, yeah, well, we never uh, even got the, the the those characters never got their conclusion because um, someone else stepped in to finish it off for them. So it's pretty like unsatisfying, like if, as like an audience a little bit. It's kind of like you're kind of let true. down because you're like you you, you you want to see them like their final showdown because like the, it's like the you know battle of good and evil or whatever, and not that. Um, there, there really isn't any portrayal of real good because like he's not he's not a real hero you know what i mean he's stealing he's stealing this money too um but as an audience like you want to see that and you're kind of deprived of it is that what makes it like not really a western you know because if this was like a clint eastwood movie there would have been this showdown at the end and there would have been this you know cathartic good guy wins and you know but in this movie there's not not that at all Mm-hmm. So um, is that does that sort of, is it like a neo western then or is that different classification? I mean, I'd still put it as a western, but it's definitely like challenging the tropes of the genre for sure. And, and if if you want to make the argument that that disqualifies it from uh, being in the genre, then go ahead and do it. I'm not going to stop you, but I I, I I let it slide. Yeah, I don't think yeah the the rules are that rigidly defined. That the good guy has to win in a western. I, mean, I think there are plenty of cynical, nebulous. So it's Western's not, out there. It's not like Sugar's rules. We can't live live by it. They're flexible. Sure. I was making um, a joke. It was a bad joke. Uh, it was a no, it's joke. fine. I mean, it is it is interesting that it's anticlimactic. But now I'm thinking about the chess match. I was like, well, he had to move his wife somewhere because Anton Sugar knew where his wife was, so she couldn't stay at her mom's house. You know where I'm going. I'm and you're at the hospital across the river. That's not where I'm going. You know where I'm going. It's not important where it is. It's where it will be. Yeah, uh, <laughs> great, great stuff. Yeah. And then, that, but that's what causes him to have to move. And the mother-in-law, I guess, has cancer. And then she has I to. I got the cancer. <laughs> How many people do I know in El Paso? <laughs> that was funny too. That 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 car ride. Like I, you, I was. You don't normally see a Mexican yeah. with a suit. And, then, <laughs> I, and there is the taxi driver or whatever. Like I, I don't know. Like he's clearly annoyed. He's like I don't. Yeah. I'm not getting paid enough to hear this old lady complain 
Uh, this is annoying. So now that we're reflecting reflecting on all of the the jokes, is this the Coen Brothers' funniest movie? <laughs> it is. Can we say that now? It's, yeah. it's not a western. It's a comedy. It's not a western. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. <laughs> I think I'm gonna barf. Uh, if you build, you will come. Uh, well, anything else to add about about No Country for Old Men? I, I bet I could guess our letterbox ratings. Every one of us. Oh yeah, I uh, one star probably. <laughs> one stars across the board. Most overrated. Most people talk about how Crash is a terrible best picture. This is the worst best <laughs> no, for, for, of all time. For, for sure, uh, five stars. Like I don't even have to think about it. This is it does everything. It's super. It's eminently watchable. If you're like screw film theory, I don't care about that. That's for lame film nerds. It doesn't matter. You can just watch this movie and have an incredible time. If you want to pick at super interesting themes that are all over the place and you can dive down those rabbit holes. Those are there too. It does everything that you yeah. want a great, that I want a great movie to do. Yeah. Entertaining, there, engaging, thought provoking. There's like, there's like this uh, cliche that people always bring up when talking about like great movies that an entertaining movie um, can't be important. And uh, this is by far one of the most entertaining movies I've ever seen in my entire life. And I would argue that it is one of the most important also. And it, it does a, such a good job of blending, um, you know, these critical uh, film experiences with just being absolutely entertaining, too. So like I was saying at the beginning of the beginning of the episode, a, a to me, this is a perfect movie. Yeah. So five star for me, too. Uh, you brought up an interesting thing, though, Ben, um, about the Oscar thing. So There Will Be Blood nominated the same year, right, for Best Picture. <laughs> this wins over there. W- where do you stand on that? If I were voting, I would vote for There Will Be Blood, which I think is also a perfect movie. But I, I, I'm not I, – I love the Oscars. I don't give a shit who they pick for the Best Picture winner. I don't get, You get mad about this stuff, Eric. I don't care. It's meaningless nonsense, and it's just funny to me. And I'm happy when a movie meets a certain threshold. Like these, there's several movies that I think good enough to be a Best Picture winner, even if it's not how I would vote. No Country for Old Men is certainly not a movie. I'm mad at one. It's great. That's totally reasonable. Totally fine. I feel about it like some people for Godfather Two, some people for Godfather One. I don't care. They're neck and neck. I'll have a preference over one or the other. If I, I have like to vote. three. I like three better. Yes. Yeah, so, Sure, that's categorically not the, <laughs> not as good as the other two. That would be weird to have that be the best one, but I don't care. I mean, I'm not. It's it's a great movie. I'm also a Paul Thomas Anderson hardcore fanboy. That's fine. Um, so I I love that you brought up uh, there will be blood because I I there's like this urban legend and I don't know how how factual it is. This is all secondhand, uh, but apparently so these two movies were filming at the exact same time in basically like the exact same area they were both being shot in texas um pretty sure and the the big scene in there will be blood where they blow up the oil rig when they were shooting that you could see it when they were shooting um this no culture for old men and they had to stop shooting for a day because of the uh the smoke in the air i'm pretty sure really? that's what I, that's what I want I, that to be true i hope that's true uh, um, that's an awesome I, I, story I, 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 it might be urban legend, but I'm pretty sure there, I, I, if anyone wants to, anyone who's listening wants to, to look it up and, and, and fact check us, go for it. But until then, like it's facts. Sure. Yeah. Like the little person in, uh, uh where's of us yeah. blowing themselves in the background. Yeah. So, okay. So you would say there will be blood, Ben is a better movie than this. I like it better. Okay. But it, D- Danny, such do a... you have an opinion on the I two? do have an opinion. I, I would pick No Country for Old Men over. I love PTA. I am a, a he's one of my favorite directors for sure in like my top like pro- th- probably like three directors ever. I love PTA. I love all of his movies. Um, but I am not as high on There Will Be Blood as like a, a lot of people are. I think it's great. Um, but I, I know a lot of people that think it's the best movie ever made, and I, I can't, I can't say that. I, I, I am. Uh, that's one of like my only like differential takes on on PTAs. I'm not high on There Will Be Blood, and we don't have to get into. That's a different oh, pod. My feelings. I, uh, I don't care. That's a whole like other pod. But uh, I would go with No Country for Old Men for sure. I, I that's that's uh, that's miles ahead for me. What an incredible year, though, that both of those movies were oh, came yeah. out the same year, same time. That's that's amazing. Like, if you think about the last five years of 
Oscar winners, none of them would compare to either of those two movies, I don't think. Oh, no. But, well, maybe Parasite. I might put Parasite up Shape there. Shape of Water is pretty great, Eric. Don't you think? Get out of here with Shape of Water. Get out Way of better here. than Dunkirk, at least. Wrong. I mean, yeah, there, there's... There'll always be good movies, um, but these ones are special. These ones set them set set themselves apart from the rest for sure. Uh, Danny, as the guest, would you like to do your five degrees fill dreams? Yes. Let me. It's gonna be short, so let me pull it up quick. Okay. So I was really worried about this because I didn't d- didn't know if um. I could uh, could do it. Then I I looked at it for like two seconds, and I was like, "Oh, this is super easy." Um, cause do you want me to start Field of Dreams, or do you want me to start at start with no uh, country? Okay, get us to Field of Dreams. So super easy. Are you ready? Uh, Woody Harrelson is in No Country for Old Men. He's in it for four seasons, nonetheless, but he is in the movie. Sure. Uh, him and Kevin Costner are co-stars in a movie called uh, The Highwaymen, which is like a Bonnie and Clyde um, perspective of the, the lawman. And then obviously Kevin Costner is the star of Field of Dreams. So there we go. Perfect. So we're, we're weirdos. We do it weirdly. We don't take the most efficient route. We're not like, hey, get us to point A. Let's get to point B as efficiently as possible. That's typically how the game goes. We decided we're just gonna make it three. You just gotta it's gotta be a okay a three movie path. And this is I don't expect you to know this or care. It's very weird. It's very very quirky, I guess. Um so like here's mine is I mean, yeah, there's a lot of different routes you can take, but I went with so Steven Root, Eric mentioned him earlier, he's great. Um at high school, and now I love office space. Um I love it even more. Where's my stapler? Got, yes, he's Where's Milton. He wants the stapler back. People took it away and they stopped paying him, which is really a dick move. Um, love Office Space. Jennifer Aniston is in that movie. She's actually in a movie with uh, Kevin Costner, but can't get there yet. So I'm just going with he's just not that into you because Ben Affleck's in that movie. And then Ben Affleck's in The Company Men with Kevin Costner, who's in Field of Dreams. So that was. Uh, so I went with my guy, Josh Brolin. He's the lead of this movie. Didn't go Thanos. I wanted to do Thanos, but uh, didn't go Thanos. Went to Sicario, which is another one of my all-time favorite movies. Incredible film. Uh, Benicio Del Toro's in that. He's also in Inherent Vice, another PTA movie. Uh, probably his – is it his worst movie? I This might be his worst I movie. I think so. It, it, I want to like it more than I do. It's It kind of yeah, frustrates probably, me. Yeah, probably. Probably. It's low tier for sure. Low tier. Uh, Jenna Malone is yeah, in that. PTA. She was in Donnie Darko as well, um, but she's in a movie called For the Love of the Game with Kevin Costner, and he's in Field of Dreams. So that's right, I have another one for you then to to make it to make it easier because uh, mine was too short before. So um, we have the Coen brothers directing this movie, who also directed one of my favorites, The Big Lebowski. Uh, in The Big Lebowski, Sam Elliott is uh, the mystical cowboy man. Uh, who is also in Draft Day with Kevin Costner, who also star Field of Dreams. Is that better for you? Sure. Perfect. Sometimes you eat okay. the bar. Sometimes the bar eats you. Got any good sarsaparilla? Mm. Sioux City sarsaparilla. Su- By the way, though, Sioux City <laughs> sarsaparilla is All I amazing. have is good sarsaparilla. It's great. Uh, all right. Well, uh, Danny, any last words on No Country for Old Men? Uh, you know, what is there to say that has already not been said? That's perfect. <laughs> You can't stop what's coming. Um, so next week we're watching Jaws. We don't have trivia this week, but that's our next movie. Uh, Danny, again, thank you so much for joining. Check out. So it's Film Bird Podcast. He said Spotify, Apple, any, anywhere you can get podcasts. Yeah, it's all over. Thanks so much for having me on. I had a blast talking about this movie. Um, looking forward to uh, listening to you guys' episodes in the future. Um, if For anyone listening, if you want to uh, check me out, yep, Film Bird Podcast. It's going to be on Spotify, Apple Pod, really anywhere. Uh, one word, Film Bird, capital F, capital B. Check it out. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Ben, what's the most you ever lost in a coin toss? A coin? I'm nothing. I've never lost anything in a coin toss. What about you? My life. I've been putting it up. Just didn't know. Just didn't know I was. All right. 
Well, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, have a good evening, and uh, go watch Jaws in No Country for Old Men. Talk to you later. Okay.